So in a sense, uh, this title is slightly misleading because I'm going to mostly initially talk about my work um, in Scotland really as a, you might say, segue or as a direction towards understanding what I want to do here in Galicia, um, which I'll discuss towards the end. Now, um, basically, what I do is I look for reasons why people did things. Really expressed, I would say, as the creation and location of material culture. I want to understand the importance of deliberate arrangement of places in relation to each other and the physical qualities of landscape itself. By looking at these things, I try to uncover the humanity of the past. So, specifically, my research concentrates on the locational choices of freestanding megalithic monuments in Western Scotland. I like to look at the reasons behind these locational choices and what all of those things together reveal about the belief systems of societies that built them. My approach uses evidence-based interdisciplinary investigations using visual context as the key indicator. My main underlying question has always been, why are the standing stones here and not somewhere else? So just to give you an idea of the presentation, I'm going to talk about the three underlying assumptions of my work, sort of theoretical, uh, connect these assumptions to my approach or methodological technique, then I'm going to talk about the actual research, <laughs> and then a brief overview of how my work connects to Philippe's, and uh, have I, have I actually, if I've got any um, typos, excuse me, <laughs> and also um, the uh, possible archaeological locations of my research focus of here. In so let's have a look at these first underlying assumption. So I use herself, a, um, basically it's a philosopher and the item in blue is the last document that discovered that was written by him. It was discovered on his desk in an envelope after his death. So, phenomenology is uh, Herschel's um, main approach to theory and he was the uh, mentor of Heidegger. Phenomenology provides a useful and sound theoretical framework for landscape archaeology, really through the consideration of this Herschelian document. Bronze Age cosmology, in fact, can be interpreted through Husserl's understanding of human experience, where together the place of an individual and her or his perception of their world creates their world. So the intention today is to offer a sharp and vibrant, hopefully, example of how phenomenology provides a framework for landscape archaeology and quantitative applications. Studying prehistoric cultural astronomy actually inherently uses Husserl's phenomenological approach and its concepts of primordial experience and the nature of vision. It helps us to understand what it was that ancient people saw when they looked at the sky and the form of their understanding. A primordial experience does not involve any prior cultural perception and therefore all human beings experience it in the same manner. The centrality of the individual is uppermost here. And um, I would say our perception and experience is based upon our physicality and our elemental nature. Sorry. The most important thing about this is that it is human-centred and it in connects humans to the universe. So in this paper up here, Herschel keenly emphasises the weight of what we call situatedness upon humans' perception of the world, where situatedness is something akin to location and surroundings and positions, all put together in one word. Significantly, he focuses very much on the literal place that humans have on the earth. In doing this, he enters the ground of very real experience in a fundamental way. 
for the heart of his argument considers people's singular place within the entire cosmos, that humans are at the centre, the centre of their being and the centre of their experience, the centre of their understanding. The cell ponders the experience of and on the earth by living human beings and compares really how this was understood now compared to in the past. I'm going to skip a bit because I'm speaking slowly so you can uh, catch what I'm saying um, and I fear I will um, be speaking for too long if I don't cut some of this out. <laughs> so the general idea is that herself supports an earth-centred view. That is, when we're looking at how the universe works, we look at it as earth-centred, as opposed to the universe being, or the galaxy, which is solar-centred. He explains that, basically, that as humans and as bodies, we are always at the centre, surrounded by others, and we reference this within our own system and as part of that system. So let's take a look at that. So the important thing is that we look at humans as an, in an Earth-based system, that we are absolutely the centre of that system, and we can understand past peoples if we try to look at their world through their eyes in the exact position or place on the Earth in which they're standing. And this is the origin of the spatiality of nature for herself. A little bit tricky. <laughs> okay. Just before I head into this, I just wanted to say then that in connection with cultural astronomy, I'll just go back, sorry, in connection with cultural astronomy then, when we, um, when we as human beings observe the sky during the day or night, it appears that the ground that we are standing on is always still and that the bodies of the heavens and sky will always move around us. That's true also if we consider things like animals passing us by. Everything is happening around us. That's how we see the world as a human being. And that's one of the underlying assumptions I use for my studying the past. The other one, <laughs> let's have a look. Many classic landscape archaeology studies often lack an innovative application of spatial analytical tools like GIS, 3D, agent-based modelling and so on because they use what we call a God's eye view, which is basically mapping from looking up and looking down on an entire landscape. Basically, these kinds of uh, techniques in landscape archaeology assume that all individuals or all agents have complete spatial information about every single position around in that landscape at the same time. Right. So they say that people, they assume in these models that people see everything at the same time, there's no restrictions on shared information, and the decisions that they make are not limited by their immediate frame of reference, which is standing on the earth, as Herschel would say. Therefore, while some state-of-the-art spatial analyses give us significant insights into the past, and are of course essential for the production of specific forms of archaeological knowledge, these approaches that are situated in the God's eye view or global framework do not really give us a perspective of individuals. By contrast, the project that I'm working on, or working towards, is connected to individual immersion model approach. It's the point of view or perspective or the egocentric frame of reference that I use. And this is shown to be a more applicable way to discover something about the way people use their language or their landscape, because it recreates that context from their point of view, not from the sky looking down. So in a sense, I hope you, can, you will see that my project goes beyond most current landscape archaeological approaches. Right, here's my third assumption. That standing stones, we're narrowing down things now from the very speculative to the actual, that standing stones are landmarks for people and the standing stones that I work in. They embody information about the landscape as the people who created them saw it and understood it. Therefore, information is very specific to the local setting 
and may not be applicable to any other setting or any other location. Standing stones are thus proxies for a single point of view, but are a constructed, physical embodiment of complex collective information. This one here. Which is similar to other monumental sites. So now I'm just going to connect these assumptions to my technique and I'll be able to put these bits of paper down and interact with you and the pictures in a more casual, comfortable way for you. So, we're going to see today that the 3D landscapes that I'm going to show you that, are, that were created for this project are essentially landscape view sheds. They're view sheds from a single viewing location at the Standing Stones and in this sense are person-centred views. Whilst rendering 3D data into a panoramic image that we do is still technically a 2D image, but because we use 3D rendering, sorry, graphical rendering techniques, it's not totally unreasonable to refer to them as 3D. The software that I use is called Horizon, and it's produced by Andrew Smith of the University of Adelaide. And if anyone wants to talk to me about that at any time, please do. <laughs> so we'll show, um, by using this uh, horizon, it actually sets itself up as a person-centred view. And it typifies and illustrates the social or cultural view of people or groups of people from a particular point in the landscape. And thus the approach herein. <clears throat> So my work is an investigative aid for examining and testing archaeological problems. So whilst it is an image, <clears throat> it is not only for illustrating knowledge already gained once serious scientific investigations have been concluded. What I want to say is that my images actually inform, um, inform and help me understand the past. And this is very, very important. So let me proceed to the study itself. Okay. So I work in Scotland. This is to show you approximately... Um, that's not working. So I work in this area here, right from the top of the left, of your left, <coughs> top Green Island, down to this island here, this island, through here, down here, and up through here. This is my entire study area. There are 125 sites in that area that I look at, and there are over 350 standing stones there. What I want to show you now quickly is the kinds of megaliths that exist in Scotland, and basically the order that they appeared in the past. So the first type were chambered tombs, and you can see the date there. They actually started off as very simple tombs, but were then expanded by people who came later. So here's an example. The next uh, uh, megalithic form to come in was standing stone monuments. They came around 3100 BC. This uh, is Callanish and is on one of the most outer western isles of Scotland. This is a different view. It was built at the same time as Stennis, which is on an island far north of Scotland called Orkney. It was built by the same people who may, you may recognise this picture. It was built by the same people who lived in this and occupied this uh, living quarters, or there's a series of living quarters. What's come to light in the last seven years or more, um, sorry, and also built that too. <laughs> A beautiful uh, passage tomb, it's a crucifix form. But what's come out since then is the only massive large temple site in northwestern Europe. This is called the Ness of Brogda. There's over 12 structures there. It's uh, surrounded by a, a very, very thick curved wall. Not all the buildings were used at the same time. And the last building was closed off and sealed by a massive uh, 
basically party and celebration and they found about up to uh, more than 300 to 400 uh, head of cattle that were sacrificed at the same time and that was the last time it was used. Now in between, um, after that period, from about 2,900 to approximately 2,400, quite a few small standing stone circles were built. I don't mean tiny, but maybe 12 metres across. And smaller stones than the first circles that you saw. But then there was a break for about 400 years. We don't have any dates. Um, let's, I'll just double check the, what that was. The dates were after about uh, 1800 BC, we don't have any dates to about 1400 BC. We don't know if that's a real gap or not. And the stones that came to be built from about 1400 BC were these single standing stones that I'm going to talk about today. They come in different forms. This is a slab because it's thin and wide. This is about three metres. You usually get photographs of sheep when you're in Scotland. <laughs> If you don't get them, it's disappointing. <laughs> the little one, it's actually a pair, one has fallen. This was a stone row, but one of them was re-erected in the wrong place. Um, that has been confirmed. This is on the Isle of Mull, where I, I work here. So just to give you some ideas of some very specific dates, you can see up here. And basically, there, this would be the latest date any of the standing stones that just suddenly stopped being built. So again, this is the um, Western Scotland where I work. The yellow dots are the show the sites that I've been working on. I have since expanded my work both within Western Scotland and a little bit through the British Isles, but I'll talk about that a bit later. And I'm showing you this map because you can see that I actually have access to elevation data for all of this area, in fact for all of Britain now, but at that time when I first started the project it was this area here. They're just the names um, which I'm going to refer to of the regions that I'm working on and um, please feel free to ask for a copy of these so you can uh, keep that for your records. Right. So the first thing that we did was to um, I'm just going to read this map. Sorry. Right. Yep. Okay. So the first thing that we did with the horizon data that came out of the uh, 3D landscape modelling was to create, we can actually create 2D models. The 2D models are very, very important. They give us a lot of information about the surrounding landscape. And I did create a model like this for every 125 sites. These 2D models tell you the exact shape of the horizon, the altitude of the horizon from the position that you're standing, and they also tell you the distance. So if you wanted to say, gee, where is that? Uh, how far away from me is that very high point in the northwest? And you can just run it down and you can see that there. Obviously, this information comes in table form in ASCII. You can extract the data in ASCII format for quantitative methods. So basically, this horizon profile is the horizon that you see when you're standing right next to the monument. So you put in your location into the software, and you put your date in as well. Um, and I'll tell you why that is. You also put your date in there. And the reason you put your date in is because the 3D model will include astronomical information from the past. So let's have a look. So for my project, in a simple way, we're, um, we're asking very specific questions. The first thing I wanted to test statistically was, are all the horizon places indicated by monument alignments somehow different to every other known place on the horizons surrounding every monument. So what does that mean? What I, uh, we asked this because we wanted to know whether or not every single monument's orientation was a, just a chance thing. 
Are we looking at something very specific that the monument is pointing to? If you have an alignment of rows, for example, stone row, or a single slab oriented in a certain direction? Or did they just put them, arrange them however? Is there any real, um, real reason behind those orientations? So what I did was I um, did a kind of cluster analysis. And the cluster analysis showed this information here. So basically for the island of Mull, we find that the positions on the horizon indicated by every single monument is not by chance. You can see that the uh, probability is very, very good. It's the same for Argyle and an island called Isla. And I'll just show you those places because you won't remember where they are. So for this region and this region and all of this region here, we discovered, without looking at the astronomy yet, that the orientation of the monuments were directed to very specific points on the horizon. We didn't know what they meant yet, we just know that they definitely were oriented towards something very significant. <coughs> so the next thing I wanted to do though was, were they clustered towards any astronomical phenomena? Is there something that we can see that's relevant? Were they aligned to the sun or the moon or Venus or something else? But we chose to test the sun and the moon because these were the ones that have so far been investigated by past peoples and, uh, sorry, by past researchers and we have some positive evidence for those. So we had a look for that. Okay, this is probably, I'm just putting this up for the statisticians, but now I'm going to explain it so you don't even have to look at that. <laughs> On the island of Mull, we know that we have very strong support for an interest in the moon at its most northern and rising setting points in its 18.6 year cycle. So basically the moon, differing to the sun, rises um, very further north than the sun and also further south than the sun and also sets further north and south. And this point on the horizon only ever occurs roughly every 19 years. So these people, these prehistoric people, were interested in orienting their monuments to these far northern and southern positions for the moon on the island of Mull. For Argyle, we actually have a, the same kind of interest in the moon, but they're also interested in aligning to the sun at the solstice. Now the solstice, you will know, only ever occurs in winter and in summer. And for Argyle, they were interested in the winter sun. For Isla, they were also interested in aligning the moon at the most extreme points that the moon rises and sets. But unusually, and unlike anywhere else so far I've discovered in the British Isles, they were interested in the midpoints between the solstice, possibly the equinox. So that's spring and autumn. I'm just going to skip that. Okay. So what I've got here is the output of our 3D models of a particular landscape on the island of Mull. And after looking at, say, 30 of these um, for Mull and then the other roughly 100 for the other places, a very specific pattern came into view. There were two patterns, actually, and this is the first, and I'm going to describe that to you. We're on the island of Mull, standing at a standing stone, or next to a stone. What you find is that at every, say around half of the sites, the northern horizon is closer and appears higher in relation to where you're standing. The southern horizon is further away and lower. Water is usually in the south, in the distant view. The sun at the solstice, that's the orange line, rises out of the top or the slope of the highest point in the northeast and sets in the range of the highest point 
in the northwest. At the winter solstice, something similar happens. In the high range in the southeast, the sun rises out and then sets over the water or in the water in the southwest. The moon at its most extreme rising and setting point do the same thing. And that's the southern rising and setting points. What's extraordinary, I'm just showing you here, is another site. That's the one that you just, this is the one you just saw. This is another site entirely. So you can see the pattern here that I'm talking about. This is what I call the classic sites. This is in the more mountainous areas. You can get the same pattern in less mountainous areas. So the horizon is quite flat, but they still make a valiant effort. <laughs> so, step. here we have, and this is almost level, this area, there's a lot of sand, um, there's not many mountains in view, but you can see they still try to set it up so that in the northeast you have the sun and the moon rising out of a high point. And that's their best attempt at the high point that they could find in the north, northwest. But again, at least in the south, you have the same rising and setting out over a set of little mountains. And water is everywhere here because basically it's a quite narrow, small area full of locks. Down here actually represents what I call a reverse site. At reverse sites, it's quite flat here. This is not as easy to see because we usually see these in view where you're only looking at this much of the horizon at the same time on a, a projection like this. So it's the view of the actual person. But basically, this is a very high, close horizon that the person is standing on. The northern view is the most distant now. It's the reverse. So even though it's the reverse, you still have them rising in and out of peaks, but most distant water is in the north. What happens in the south at a lot of these sites is not only is it higher and closer, but often the moon is blocked. And we'll talk a bit about that later. <coughs> so here's another reverse site on the island of Mull. And you can see it much more clearly here. Water mainly in the north. The southern horizon, uh, sorry, the northern horizon is quite quite low. The southern horizon is, is very high by comparison. And so the sites split up into these two groups across Scotland. The other thing that's quite noticeable is that particularly um, if it's a single standing stone, is they're often set in what I call an amphitheatre. So the stone is looking out into the distance across the water, but it is surrounded by a low, uh, sorry, a higher close horizon. So when I say, I did say low then, what I meant was it might only be 50 metres high, but it's still much higher relatively to the distant horizon. So you're in this little cove. It's a very, very private space. And it's a quite common. Okay. Right. So I'm just uh, getting a quote, obviously from Philippe in relation to what we've just seen there, that obviously each specific monument or megalithic form has, a ma has major variations, like those different 3D landscapes. They were all a little bit varied, but at the same time, they still had the same pattern. And the variation is really, that underlies that, is, as to quote here, underlying the fact that it was a specific actual that the variation comes down to a specific time, place, and monument, and the people. Okay, just quickly now, this is Kalanish now from the top. You can actually see what an amazing monument it is. The reason I'm telling, uh, coming back to this, is that this monument existed nearly 2,000 years before those simple standing stone monuments. We've now found that this site, using our 3D landscapes and a brand new form of statistical test that can test 
the statistical um, validity of a standing stone circle. We've now proved that the same pattern holds for the sites that came 2,000 years before, the two earliest ones being Carmish and Stennis. So they have the same values and they've been carried down for some reason for over 2,000 years. As we say, there is that 400 year gap. Did it stop and did it start again? We don't know yet. <laughs> Here's a beautiful circle, one of my favourite locations ever in England, in Cumbria. You can see at the top there, same landscape pattern. With the sun and the moon coming out of the highest points in the northeast and the northwest and lower in the south. There is no water there because basically it's exceedingly mountainous. You'd have to go to the edge of the plateau to see the water. In the same region, the slightly skewed actual virgin, a virgin, 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 again, doing the best they can with the mountain arrangement, but they, you look around, find the right place, same concept going on there. And these are actually also considered to be Neolithic circles. That's just a nice picture. <laughs> That's Dennis. Really showing and trying to give you a, a view of the idea of what, what it would be like at night time with the beautiful northern lights at these sites you'll see that the quartz in the stone shines so you'll find there's also a lot of quartz in these monuments okay so we didn't they're just some of the messages for the 3d landscape software horizon but we've also done other things since which i'll quickly go through we can now extract the 3d landscapes from these models and we can insert them into other packages. So we insert them into a project, uh, sorry, a package called Stellarium. I'm not running it now because it would just take too long and um, you know, time is precious. So you can put the 3D landscape into an astronomy package called Stellarium and you can have the sun and the moon and the entire night sky and day sky running in the background. So you set it to a very specific date, the exactly the same coordinates as the monument and hit go and then just watch the movements of the night sky and the day sky. You can also put in 3D landscape, panoramic landscapes into that now, which is um, a really fabulous thing to do and it allows you to get some sense of what was going on and what may or may not have been watched in the past and then you can test for it yourself later, see if that's actually what they were looking at. So this just gives you an idea of how, when you're using Stellarium, that you can put in a photograph, obviously this is not Stellarium, but it gives you a, vision, a kind of an idea of what you can get out of Stellarium. It has those, this kind of view is possible, and it's, it's very evocative, and I think it's very useful in trying to position yourself and trying to think about how people in the past were wondering about what their place was in the universe. Importantly, two of the two most common denominators in standing stone monuments are the dead and astronomy. And it's the cremated dead. And I think this has something to do with concepts of transformation. We watch the transformations of the sun and the moon in the sky that are indicated by the monuments. And we have the bodies which are forcibly transformed through cremation to go through quick transformations to then be united with the standing stones. You'll find that the parts of people's bodies are placed in the pits, the stone pits before the stone is erected. So not only are they sometimes associated with tombs or cairns, you'll find that the bodies themselves are actually buried with, or parts of them buried with the standing stones. Is this about animating the standing stones? Is this some kind of transformation for the stone as well? Are the stones now part of the community and taking on the role of observation of what's happening in the sky? So what I'm just going through very quickly is some of the interpretation. The 3D landscapes have actually helped me understand some concepts that seem to be centering around the position of the standing stone monuments. <coughs> 
These are concepts of close and further away in the horizon, for example. North and south and east and west all set up against each other, rising and setting, long days and short days, such as the summer solstice and the winter solstice, simple cycles and complex cycles. However, I don't think theirs is a theory of opposition. These all together, whilst they set up in opposition, tell the story of cycles. So I think that's the, in a very, it might be simple, but I think it's complicated that they recognise that their cycles are set up as a, a series of oppositions and they're always pulling things into balance. And these monuments, in many ways, represent the places where you can see these things happening. You can see the cosmos in action and you can see the cosmology in action. Okay. I have uh, about, I'm sure, at least six pages describing my um, interpretations, but uh, we need to move on. I'm conscious of the time. What I'm going to do very quickly now is I just want to have a little conclusion about what I've spoken about with the Scottish Isles and then I'm going to actually talk about this work. So let's, I'm just going to read that. So from the Neolithic to the Bronze Age, I feel that we can say that there is a clear understanding of the universe in prehistoric Scotland based on the notion of and recognised in the actuality of opposition. So as I said, these oppositions are not seen as separate occurrences. They're not linear ideas basically facing off at each other across a divide. Rather, they are a whole system and they are cyclical. These understandings of how the universe worked were engineered by prehistoric peoples to be experienced together from the purview of the standing stones, from being at the standing stones. These experiences both reflect and create a world. They create a world vision. They illustrate how their world was seen and should be seen, and they should be known like this to the community. In this setup, the stones are seen as an element of the very cosmic system they are drawing the community's attention to. And in this way, these stones gain social power and relevance through a shared communal significance. I feel, as Bradley has said himself, that um, these monuments are not byproducts of more important processes, but are entangled with them. And in Heideggerian terms, really, that means they participate in the process of community. So all of the evidence that I've shown you is based either on material culture, that's the standing stones, what may be found there, and the physical events that occurred at the time of the monument's construction. So I think in this way we observe the natural material world of the past peoples. I've used these materials to come closer to an understanding of the way past peoples literally saw their world in various 3D reconstructions. Through these approaches, I feel that you can really transcend past interpretations of understanding our way Neolithic and Bronze Age people viewed, comprehended and constructed their world. So now I'm just going to talk a little bit about my work, as I hope to see at Insipid. So it's my intention to apply the kinds of theoretical constructs that I've just discussed and the approaches uh, in conjunction with those of Philippe to the project work here. What is important to note is that much of my, uh, many of Philippe's ideas and my own do overlap <coughs> in, in their interests and focus. And whilst our methods have been quite different, we've made some similar discoveries. Um, as you might know already, this concept of, in a sense, an amphitheatre or a hidden space around a monument. This is an, uh, so, both of these show that the location preferences of megalithic monuments uh, are linked to concepts of openness and closeness, and they operate to make special places for the creation and rituals that may take place at these monuments and the importance of these. More importantly, perhaps, my theoretical ideas resonate with Philippe such that 
Though they have developed out of different traditions to some degree, it is clear that the following ideas, for instance, sit well both within my own project concepts uh, that will be set up at Insipid and Philippe's. You may recognise if you've actually read Philippe's expert's article, here are some of the things that he has stated and I feel they fit in very well with the ideas that I have myself and would like to develop further under Philippe's guidance. So for example, space is, space is fundamental. It underlies human action and it materialises, making it possible to produce order. The spatial form is never independent of the systems of representation. Very important. It flags human environment relationships, human as an agent in landscape dynamics, and so forth. <clears throat> So here are the uh, possible regions that I'm looking at working in. Um, I'm not sure, Philip, you'd like to add anything to this information itself. We've got uh, this is the Sierra that I went to visit recently, which was amazing. And um, some of you have probably been there already to Bavampa. It was a pretty incredible <laughs> place to be. But also, there's a notion we've only touched on this. That this amazing dolmen, which has already been excavated, as you can see, is surrounded by um, other very interesting archaeological features which have not been studied in a landscape archaeological approach before. And perhaps this is, this, in a sense, a cultural centre linking all of those monuments together. So I have a few and my project will be set up in the following way. To what degree, primary research question, to what degree did the peoples of prehistoric Galicia and Western Scotland share the same locational choices and understandings connected with the erection of megaliths? And I'm asking that, though of course we know they are different types, but despite that, are there any, at, in the same time periods, are there any connections there? Or even later, so for example, in Scotland, we know that this, these locations, um, variables, existed for over 2,000 years. Is it the same for Galicia or not? And as you, I've said here, I'll need to combine known material in, your, in the general area of Galicia to date with the new work that I'm doing. And I'd like to create a sharp yet detailed and informative synthesis on the knowledge of megalithic monuments to date in Galicia. And then compare it with other areas, but in particular because I've worked in Scotland that would be a target area. But I'll talk to Philippe and maybe others of you might have some ideas and that would be great to hear those. I won't go through these in detail, I just want you to know that I have objectives. <laughs> okay. And one of those is, for example, to determine the way the landscape and astronomical phenomena, if that's the case here, could be seen during the time the site's constructed. Or, um, and also, I would like to fully understand the choices made for the erection of monuments in both uh, Galicia and Scotland. They might be different. It would be good to find out. But we know that people are talking to each other across the West, through the Atlantic. What kinds of other material culture have they shared or not, as the case may be? So ultimately, to establish a greater understanding of the possible sharing of this human history and cultural activities across time. I have also, my research questions are set up. And just one example would be, what material culture is contemporaneous with prehistoric standing stone uh, arrangements in Scotland and the megaliths that should read of Galithia? There are no known standing stones in Galithia, as in separate from others. And just the final one, what might have been the motivation between, uh, behind the construction choices of the builders of the monuments in these two places? I think that's really important to know. That's one of the ultimate research questions. And you've seen this quote already about Bradley, but I just wanted to end with this lovely picture here um, of a standing stone, also an Orkney of Bradley. I'll just re-quote this then, that 
it is theoretically relevant to uphold that monuments are not byproducts of more important processes. They are actually entangled with all of the processes. They are the important thing. The monuments are the important thing. And as I've said before, I think you'll find that what's very relevant is that they participate as part of the community. They engage with the community. The community engages with them. And Heidegger would say that after you've set up these monuments, your engagement with them gives back to you an understanding of yourselves and your own understanding of your cosmos. You have given it its understanding and it feeds that back to you. So, thank you. <laughs>